Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Sharjah Museum's special online event as we look to highlight the impact of Arab women artists. My name is Sally Musa, and on this International Women's Day, we're about to hear from an incredible panel of some of the most influential women in Arab art today. As Sharjah Art Museum launches the latest edition of the Lasting Impressions exhibition, this time it is celebrating one of the most prolific and acclaimed Arab women artists, Algeria's Baya Mahyadeen. The exhibition showcases works spanning her astonishing six decade career, including works from her first exhibition in Paris in 1947, where she earned great acclaim, gaining recognition from some of the leading figures of Europe's artistic avant-garde, including Picasso and André Breton. This is the first landmark exhibition for Bayer in the region and brings to light her pivotal impact on the, forma on the formation of a distinct North African modernism in the arts while also being linked to international post-war movements. To help us explore the scope and influence of Arab women artists, their achievements, their challenges, as well as highlighting Bayer's extraordinary talents and influence, I'm excited to welcome tonight's panel. Dr. Neda Shabuth, Professor of Art History at the University of North Texas, Hala Khayat, Regional Director of Art Dubai and Scholar on Arab and Middle Eastern Contemporary Art. And last but not least, Sahela Takesh, Curator of Bajil Art Foundation and also the co-curator of the Lasting Impressions Bayam Hiddin exhibition. Welcome, ladies. Welcome. Thank you. Sally. So great to have you all. Now, just before we start, I'd like to let everyone know that there will be a chance for our speakers to answer your questions at the end. So please do type those into the question and answer box that's at the bottom of your screen. So, Professor Shabbat, if I can start with you. When we take a look at art history globally, women have been more often than not the subject of the art rather than the artists themselves in control of the artistic and indeed the cultural narrative. So how would you frame the canon of art history and whether or not there's been a lack of representation of women in global art history? Yes, thank you, Sally, for that question, which um, we teach courses on. <laughs> it's so loaded. But I'm hoping that um, many of, of our attendees have heard um, or know the article by Linda Nockland, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? It was first published in 1971 in the Art News and is considered one of the first major works of feminist art history. This essay, which I assign in my courses, in all of my courses, talks about the, um, it, it, it is, it's more, you know, it's less about why we don't know about what, um, you know, great women art, uh, artists uh, in the canon, but it is more about the, um, the problem with the canon and that, that the problem that this question actually assumes when you ask, you ask it, is there no woman, a great woman of, uh, um, uh, in, in, in history? I mean, sure, we'll exhibit them if they exist, right? But the, the question is, why haven't they existed? We need to unpack that canon and figure out the methodology behind their exclusion. This is something that has been happening since. And the 1970s has been you know, very strong about um, uh, with women movements and in the United States, but globally as well. So the, question, the answer would be that um, we have a lack of women representation in the canon, uh, but we're working on it. The assumption has always been that it was white male voice that is the art historian. So there are now actually more uh, women art historians. And so that, you know, hopefully also is helping in uh, revising the canon. And so how does that compare when we are talking about the representation of Arab women artists as well? So, I mean, the thing about, you know, the lack of representation of women in the canon 
kind of corresponds to the lack of representation of any other in the canon. So, you know, women were considered like any other, so the, the Arabs, um, and all non-Western, so-called non-Western art, uh, art was excluded from the canon. Um, and even when it was represented indirectly, like let's say, you know, art of, of um, uh, Egypt or Mesopotamia, it was seen as the root of Western civilization and only represented in a specific way. So when we're talking about Arab woman, then we have a double uh, a sword here because Arab art is uh, uh, absence from the canon and clearly then the woman as well. But also the problematic is that, you know, the historiography of Arab art has not been fully developed in the Arab world. And, you know, I mean, we can say that um, we didn't have much of documentation until recently things are changing. But of course, I'm very conscious when I say this to not have our listeners assume that it needs to be something similar to the canon of art history that we have here in the West. It could be something completely different. In fact, we're working on a project now called Mapping Art Histories of the Arab World, Iran and Turkey, where we're hoping to understand what is our, how is art history perceived in, in other places in the world and then figure out how we can globalize the canon as such. I love that. That is just so incredibly needed right now. But for you, um, Professor Shabul, what are the biggest issues that women have faced in being um, represented as well. And I'd love that, you know, for you to talk about the artists who have been able to break through as well. So, I mean, you know, clearly we've always, um, you know, if we talk about the modern age, we've always had women artists in the modern age, um, whether in the Arab world or, you know, worldwide. Um, and in fact, for the, I remember uh, a conversation I have with, um, um, uh, Hannah Malala, Iraqi woman artist, who for the longest time, for example, resisted the, the title of woman artist attached to her because she believed that she's an artist first and woman, you know, the, the gender doesn't matter and assumed that this is how it was in Iraq throughout. But after, uh, after a while of, of uh, particularly living outside of Iraq, she came to the realization that women were not represented because they were not even taught in the academy where she studied. So the great women artists of Iraq, for example, like um, uh, Suad Latar and Medi Omar and others, you know, were not known even in the art academy in Iraq. And so she realized that, yes, the conversation, the narrative was formed by men and was where, while well, the women were allowed and we assume were uh, welcomed, but it was, um, they were given that space, not they didn't own it. So their agency was compromised by that. So, you know, um, there are, um, uh, despite of all of that, many, you know, great women uh, artists. I mean, you were talking about Baya here, for example, um, as a, um, uh, a woman artist whose work was very um, um, strong and distinctive. And aside from, um, exhibiting in, in Paris or with Picasso, which to me doesn't necessarily add any value to her. Um, but, you know, she um, was also recognized, um, you know, uh, unfortunately outside of her context, which is another problematic that, you know, we have in the region that we're working on and, and changing. I think, you know, the fact that we're here talking about this attests to the change that has happened. It's so vitally important. So Hela, um, if I can come to you now, I would love for you both as the curator for Bajil Art Foundation and the co-curator of the spectacularly new um, Baya Mahideen exhibition. First of all, congratulations on the exhibition. Uh, and we should give a special shout out as well to your co-curator, Alia and Mulla as well. Um, so, so Hela, it seems that we're seeing you know, Sharjah leading the way when it comes to not only the representation of women artists, but looking to address that imbalance um, where the representation of female artists is concerned. Um, and I know particularly Arabs, and now I know that Barjil Art Foundation last November, they decided to actually hang an exhibition that was split 50-50 between men and women artists. So talk to us about the thinking behind that, how Sharjah Art Museum and Brajil Art Foundation are really ahead of the game here. 
Sure, thank you so much, Sally, for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Nada, first of all, I mean, I would echo everything you have just said about sort of the way that the canon has been formed. And um, definitely, Sally, there is, you know, women are underrepresented in uh, mainstream global art history, as are other groups, as Nada mentioned, right? So uh, whatever kind of minority or other groups of people that are relegated to the periphery of the perceived center uh, also kind of fall out of the, of the discourse. And I think, you know, what it really boils down to is kind of the existence of particular power structures and how those structures operate. And so when we speak about um, rethinking or maybe destabilizing some of the structures in order to create a more inclusive uh, model uh, or a more inclusive canon, this doesn't really happen along straight lines, right? It's never really um, a neat process. It doesn't happen along singular channels, I think. Um, and so, um, you know, in, in sort of in speaking about this, I think uh, there's value in all of us kind of starting where we are and starting to do the work. And this work will oftentimes be hinged on experiment and on trial and error, because when, you know, it, when you figure out, okay, what doesn't work, um, you don't necessarily always immediately have the idea of what the new model will look like or how it will operate or have all the details figured out. And this calls for uh, experimental approaches, including in the museum, which is something we've done with this iteration of Virgil's show at the Sharjah Art Museum. And another thing I have to say is, you know, I think um, academic discourse in many ways happens quicker than it is implemented in practice. Um, so there are things, um, in other words, that have already been spoken about and debated and deconstructed in the uh, in sort of the academic context. And um, now that you mentioned Linda Nochlin's essay and uh, Ali and I actually also reference it in the BIA catalog. <laughs> it's been what, 50 years now or more? Um, and so, you know, but on the ground, you do still come across these stumbling blocks that um, intellectual discourse has left far behind. And so, you know, when, um, when these conversations, sort of interdisciplinary conversations begin to happen, it's, it's very easy to be surprised as to, you know, why are things still done the old way? <laughs> but when you're, when you're trying to implement these things on the ground, you know, the least of which kind of, you know, as, as a simple example is including more women into museum collections, but you do come across palpable stumbling blocks, which you have to address. So, you know, you have to be prepared that it is a, a slow process, but, um, you know, one has to start somewhere. And with the Bargiel show, I think more than anything, we wanted to just add a little bit acceleration to that conversation. The, I would love for you to elaborate a bit more, Sohaila, about those kind of stumbling blocks that you do find. You know, you do have this mission of trying to make it more inclusive and trying to address that imbalance. What, in, in practical terms, you're curating, you're planning, you're trying to put together this 50-50 exhibition. So what happens? Take us through that and help us understand what you're facing. Sure. Well, I mean, the simplest thing, and again, <laughs> that is something you already mentioned, sometimes we simply don't know about the existence of certain artists or their bodies of work. Um, sometimes, you know, they might come up in an auction or you would to hear of them somewhere, but um, these bodies of work on a very fundamental level are just still being documented a lot of the times. And so um, in our case, um, the founder of Brazil, Sultan Sud del um, he has a very active social media platform. So that is a huge help, I have to say, in our work as Brazil, because since these histories are still being written, a lot of the work and research we do is by word of mouth. You know, that is this is why most of us actually have social media accounts and Facebook and Instagram and all of these things, because it helps us to connect with families of artists or, uh, you know, someone who has heard of someone and uh you know leading up to the show sultan actually put out a call on his social media platform saying you know does anybody know of uh women artists who practiced between let's say the 1940s and the 1980s right and we did get quite a bit of responses and were connected to families of artists and uh you know again by word of mouth and ended up acquiring a number of works this way for the exhibition 
Um, so, you know, the challenges really are kind of very basic, very simple in many ways, but uh, nevertheless, they do take time um, to, to overcome and, and, and rewrite the, the histories in, in kind of palpable ways, right? <laughs> it's not just one artist, woman artist that you need to find, you need to really dig. <laughs> Well, exactly. Yeah. And it kind of, it speaks to that whole expectation around women. Yes, they could be artists, but it, it is likely that they were not professional artists, that they were not, you know, recognized at a professional level. And it's, it is something that they might've done behind the scenes and, and they're not expected to be out there. Um, I just remember, you know, him saying um, uh, to that point, um, that he had been taking some students around the, the modern art from the Middle East exhibition. And he was apologizing to them because only five or six of the 19 works were by women. And they actually said, well, actually that's more than the total number of works by female artists in the whole museum. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so because only 13% um, of artists are women in represented in US museums. And so, you know, this is this is a real problem that we are seeing here. And I just remember, you know, learning about, for example, Christo at school, um, we never heard about Jean-Claude, you know, because like they never put themselves out there together until 1994. They were like, okay, so, you know, it's better for one artist to be out there. It's easier to be more well-known. And then suddenly actually, you know, he had this incredible partner in crime who was, who had the ideas. So it's like this thing, it's, it's this mentality. Do you feel like that there is this mentality that, you know, women, yeah, okay, they have ideas, but they're not at the forefront. It's just, it's something, you know, something that's there. Nada, I can see you nodding. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, this is the whole thing. Women were mm. either, either not taken seriously or not given the chance to, they don't have the same, um, uh, possibilities, right? They, they were not accepted in art academies for the longest time. They were not encour encouraged to be, um, you know, um, uh, professional artists. They would never be described as genius or original. And so, you know, at best they would do some um, woman stuff, you know, embroidery and, you know, yeah. that, that kind of house and craft. Stuff house exactly craft which of course also is another problem because it is that hierarchy within the canon created various um, obstacles so it's not just simply like um Suhaila saying that we need to find them right because we know some did exist like you said uh, maybe they were not in the forefront maybe they practiced behind the scenes so we need to find them we need to evaluate them we need to contextualize them we need to you know provide material but we also need to dismantle the structure because even the reason why you know Sohail is saying we may be talking about these things in academia and clearly women movements and the arts have been really strong since the 1970s and accomplished a lot and they in fact became um, even politicized and so you know but in the last hanging of um, when they reopened at MoMA one of the main things they were boosting about is that they have increased the number of women artists in on display. So even until you know this this day and age in the 21st century, we're still dealing with these issues, with these problems. I want to actually mention something. I I'm sure you know Suhaila and, and Hala know know that, but you know maybe it's been a while and people forgot. One of the um, most important exhibitions that happened for women artists of the Arab world was Forces of Change, Artists of the Arab World, that was curated by Selwa Makdadi, who actually at the time had something called International Council for Women in the Arts and had an incredible, she still has it, incredible database of um, you know women artists. She went around the Arab world locating as many as she can and interviewing and documenting. So she has an incredible archive about it. And she was able to do this exhibition that opened at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in 1994 and toured. It went to Atlanta, Miami, to um, uh, Cambridge and uh, Massachusetts. So it was a way of a great catalog, great essays. It was a great way of taking advantage of that momentum of the um, uh, women's art, uh, women's movements, you know, feminist art movements and inserting this, you know, opening this exhibition. I think that, you know, made an incredible um, uh, contribution to 
including Arab women artists in, in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. If I just might jump in for a second here, uh, in, in, in the context of Baya's exhibition, uh, she was actually, uh, her work was part of Forces of Change, and Selwa went to Blida in Algeria to meet her just a year before, and for everyone in the audience, if you get a chance to visit the show, we actually have a, a video interview that Selwa Baghdadi conducted with Baya in 1993 in Blida. Um, and this was during the civil war, you know, it was a very dangerous time to travel, but she did go nevertheless. So, um, you know, it's, it, it is a very important uh, historical document, which kind of then, uh, you know, led to this groundbreaking exhibition in 1994. So, Hayla, I'd love for you to talk to us more about the Baya exhibition and about this mesmerizing artist. And, you know, why is this exhibition particularly so important right now? Sure. Well, the exhibition, um, as you know, is, is part of an annual series that the Sharjah Art Museum hosts. It's called The Lasting Impressions. And the idea is that every year um, an artist from the Arab world is selected for their significant contribution, not just for to, uh, to regional art histories, but also to, you know, more broadly to, to sort of global histories. Um, and usually these artists are also um, have have more often than not not yet had a major retrospective in in the region in the Arab world. So by of course, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning, she kind of rose to this early fame with her Paris exhibition at the age of only 16. Um, but um, after that, she did lead quite a reclusive life. And even though she, um, you know, starting from the 1960s onwards, her work did participate in group exhibitions almost every year. And uh, after her passing in the late 90s, Algeria did have um, a sort of a retrospective, uh, organized a retrospective for her. But in recent years, she hasn't had a museum show in the region, especially one that would span the entirety of her practice from the 1940s all the way to the 1990s. And actually, we're, um, we're so delighted to have her very last piece in the exhibition that we got from her family uh, done um, in November of 1998. And she, she passed before she could finish it. Um, and alongside that, we, uh, we, uh, the, the family was very generous to lend us a dress of bias that she wore uh, to her exhibition in Paris. So <laughs> we almost wow. have the two bookends of her entire career presented in the show. Um, of course, you know, uh, besides kind of being, um, having this interesting history, she is a very uh, distinct artist. Again, as was mentioned um, already, she had a very unique uh, approach and style to her work. Um, it, uh, she, it, you know, is super difficult to place art historically, whether we're talking about sort of the canon, the, the Arab art canon that is still being formulated or even the global art canon. Um, she was very, very idiosyncratic about who she was. She even came up with a term for, his, for herself. She said, you know, my style is biaism. <laughs> she already knew that she was very difficult to put into a category. And um, in the video that we have in the show from 1993, uh, another art historian is also part of the of the video, uh, Malika Batilla. She also speaks about this difficulty of categorizing Baya's work. You know, is she a surrealist? Is she a naive artist? Is she a self taught artist, quote unquote? So you know, she kind of evades uh, all of these different groups and creates something that is just very unique and just very her. But it's just that's what I love about her. It's one of one of the things that I love about her that you just cannot pigeonhole her into anything and her work speaks to life and joy and you know I, I love actually what you said Neda about okay yes she might have been you know praised by Picasso and Andre Breton but you know that shouldn't add to to her greatness she already is great but I just I love this quote this you know he wrote the preface Breton wrote the preface from her catalog in 1947 and he said, I speak not as others have to deplore an ending, but rather to promote a beginning. And at this beginning, Baya is queen. And, you know, he says the beginnings of this age lie with Charles Fourier and the new impetus has just been furnished by Malcolm de Chazelle. But for the rocket that launches the new age, I propose the name Baya. 
Yeah, that's pretty extraordinary. That's that's phenomenal. And yes, we shouldn't be kind of looking at this artist's success in 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 the context of of her being recognized by you know but it is important yes that yeah. she was recognized by one of the main um you know figures of the movements it's just that you know we need to for me particularly i'm always very conscious about seeking validation yes. by you know being um not from the west from the so-called center if we want to decenter mm -hmm. we need to start looking you know away from uh from um, these sort of way of, of thinking but nevertheless it is an important um uh thing you know it, it was a good thing. <laughs> so, yeah. A great thing. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 one of the important things about her is is that she was a female artist painting women. You know, so she was very much detached from that idea of the male gaze and and she was, you know, in control and putting women into her into her works. And and, and that is a very important narrative and a very important part of her work, is it not, Sohaila? Yes, definitely. I mean, um, you know, for one thing, of course, she was surrounded by women growing up. Um, she she has quite a dramatic biography. You know, she was orphaned at a young age and then raised by her grandmother, followed by a, um, a French uh, woman who uh, became her um, adoptive mother. Um, but also, you know, as you said, Bai is a woman painting women. So I feel in, in many ways the representation is kind of a little more reliable, if that makes sense, in the sense that it's not, you know, maybe not as skewed by other kinds of lenses, uh, yeah. whether it's the, like the male gaze or the colonial gaze or what have you. Of course, you know, of course she absorbed a rough, uh, references from everywhere. She was exposed both to European modernism, but also to Algerian heritage and, um, you know, uh, kind of a Messiah traditions and all of these things. So she is a composite, you know, her practice is a composite of all of these different conflu confluences. Um, yeah. Um, but, you know, in some ways, maybe the women are not as exoticized in her view um, as, as uh, you know, an Algerian woman would be by, uh, say, an Orientalist painter who came to the region. Um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like they might be more believable. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, exactly. It's kind of that un unfiltered view. Um, and, you know, she brings her own, you know, she, her soul shines through. Hala, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective uh, on the discussion and um, in terms of, you know, your perspective on, on the representation of women and how the art market plays a role in this as the market for contemporary Arab art rises and the region becomes part of the international art circuit and a hub for collectors are works by women attracting the same monetary value as those by men, for example? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so far enjoying so much the conversation. I don't want you to stop. Uh, I would like to salute on Women's Day, every, all of you, and also uh, Dr. Talwa Maqdadi uh, uh, for that amazing show that we all know about because we're in the scene, Sharjah Museums for these wonderful, amazing uh, shows. I'm going tomorrow, actually, tomorrow morning, so I let to see finally the bio show. Uh, and then last but not least, also for Tu Sultan, who through his amazing uh, platform on social media, although I tried to limit my hours on Instagram, uh, he launched this amazing campaign uh, a couple of years ago, and we all got engaged into finding him, you know, uh, finding with a lot of other people, you know, uh, women artists from Syria to Tunisia to, to Algeria and so on. And I think Baya is a very lucky artist to have uh, Sharjah Museum looking into her life. And, and finally, I think it's the largest uh, retrospective ever. So well done, you all. Um, I think the market to start with, so uh, I wanna re uh, use the term that Suhaila used, which is ex experimental approaches. I think the market also has been experimental vis-a-vis uh, -vis the women work in the last 15 years in the region, because it's been also uh, not that, um, I think women artists in general all over the world did not have their place until much later uh, in the history of the market of like 150, 200 years. So uh, usually we, we, I noticed that younger collect, new collectors to the market are driven uh, by patronism uh, to start with by nationalism. So they would buy work from their own countries and then work that relate to them. And then sometimes if this artist is a woman and it's from their own country, they would 
acquire work, it's not necessarily um, driven by the fact of the gender, but you, we did get in the beginning a lot of questions about, but will, will it uh, grow in value? Is it a good investable piece? You know, which I always did not encourage people to buy art with that mentality. It should be always driven by, you know, emotions. Uh, it's true that it took a few big uh, milestones for the perception in the Arab world to change. I would like to uh, recall, for example, the amazing show that the Tate put together, which is uh, the show of Salwa Rauda in 2013, uh, you know, highlighting the work of Etel Adlan suddenly all over uh, Europe, um, Iranian artist Munir Farman Farmayan in New York, uh, Samia Halabi finally getting a gallery representation in the Middle East after, you know, being a great artist for the longest time in New York. So a lot of things took place. We are still in the experimental phase, I think, uh, which is really pushing each one of us and each foundation, each platform to, to push harder and perform and to rewrite the art history, which kind of affects the market because it's when suddenly there's a book about an artist, there is suddenly more interest and then collectors start to react and then money come into play. So sometimes it's, the opposite so a great work comes to auction it sells for a high number and then people notice and then suddenly people open their uh, homes and and be like oh i remember i have a work by this artist but it's just like behind the curtain so let me just put it uh, in the living room you know so you see uh, the the channels changing but yeah it's true that uh, the market is, is reflective always so now that buy a show is on i received so many calls just like the last two weeks saying, Hala, do you have access to buy a work? Can we buy? I'm like, you're too late. You're late by a few years now. We sold Baya back uh, in, the, in the mid 2000, and, I mean, since the auction, international auction calendar started after 2007. And uh, I have to say that it was one of the first time we were selling works of art on paper by female artists, because even in those years, you have also a problem with selling works on paper because you know the perception was that works on canvas are more important are better investment for the future but it's the truth is that baya kind of uh, uh, challenged this and uh, her work always performed really well and now she's a star she's incredible absolutely so th that kind of, you know, brings me back to a, to a point that Neda has also mentioned, and, th and that is the problem of, of women being recognized in their own countries first. You know, you mentioned Sami ha Halabi as well, you know, being such a, a brilliant uh, artist in New York for the longest time before getting re retrospective here. Um, you know, how big a problem is that still? You know, are perceptions changing around female artists, particularly you know, in the contemporary setting in, in the last couple of decades? I think that, uh, honestly, I, I, I witnessed it through my own uh, age, that when I went to the fine art school, I, although I had very good grades in my, in my final year, and those who met me after, they were like, oh, so you didn't do well at school. So fine art was considered, you know, for the losers. Like, if you're right. a girl, you go to the fine art school, you're like, uh, you didn't do your math or physics, although it was really not true. The truth is that fast forward, now I see a lot of uh, moms who are so proud saying, oh, I'm sending my daughter to an art school. And I'm talking about a Damascene um, society or, a, you know, Beirut society or an Emirati society. So I think... Uh, the sh you know, the, the change is there. It's happening very rapidly. We should really salute all the efforts that are being done. Um, a lot of publications are uh, out there. A lot of women are getting into academia and writing amazing books on, on art and not only on women artists. So I think there is a big shift, but we're still, uh, we still need to continue this battle. Um, in terms of market, I think that honestly, uh, all over the world, the, the market for female art is always a bit behind. I don't know if it's linked to only the gender or the, you know, less uh, trust in the performance. Like a lot of them, fall, you know, I think because women are more emotional, they fall into like, they don't take it as a career. Or I think the perception is that they are encouraged to, to pick up uh, art as a hobby in a lot of societies. And I think uh, uh, in the exhibition taking shape, 
uh, maybe Suhaila can add on that, that it was, you know, a lot of women artists in Syria were, were amazing artists in the 50s and 60s, and then they stopped. And when you ask their sons and grandchildren, they're like, no, she, she was never encouraged because it was like the thing she did on her own, but not for her, her own house, for her own family. Uh, that women from these good uh, families, they did not need to exhibit or sell their work. And I mm. think now you have 20 year old students calling me saying, how do I price my work? Can you help me? So it's, uh, it's a big shift now. And hopefully one day you will see uh, more women art in auctions, in art fairs, and um, in exhibitions. Oh, we definitely hope so. Um, and, and I want to ask as well about, you know, making sure that we have women involved at every level when it, where it comes to galleries and museums and, um, you know, buying and art auctions and so on and so forth. You know, it's interesting in Sharjah, particularly Sharjah museums, for example, when we're talking about Sharjah Art Foundation, um, women there are involved at the highest levels of leadership, of course. You've got Her Excellency Mina Ataya, Director General of Sharjah Museums, doing incredible things. Sheikh Ahur Al Qasimi, leading Sharjah Art Foundation. And, you know, women being involved at all levels within the art world there. And what kind of a difference can that actually have in promoting more women artists as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just amazing. I think that uh, I look at each one of you and uh, you're all in amazing positions, pushing the art scene further. And uh, no, I think we're lucky to be in living in this time and age. Uh, we should just continue and uh, not limited only to women. It's, uh, it's funny because there was a lot of time when I worked with only women and then suddenly I had uh, a group of young uh, uh, male interns, you know, and it was a bit different, you know, to 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 be the the woman boss and and have uh, younger male people working with. But uh, no, I think um, I think it's just amazing. Mm. Can I may I yeah, ask yes. or just say something? I mean, you know, if you actually look at um, let's say Jordan, the museums in Jordan, they're mostly also led by women. You know, whether um, Her Highness uh, Wujdan uh, uh, Al-Hashimi or, um, you know, uh, Suha Shuman. I think we need to be careful to also understand that while we have women um, heading, you know, um, what looks like they're in leadership, you know, we need to understand though the, the parameters within which um, they're operating in, in various ways. Because art is thought to be not as important, so can be rele relegated to the women's domain. You know, this could happen in many museums. So to what, a, a, to what extent is leadership there able to push because the structure is still a male structure. So, you know, just because we are, we're getting there, which is a great thing in, you know, because we can push, we need to make sure we actually revise our language. So we are not allowed to do, but we are, we have the agency to do. Because, you know, we, you hear about how these women who were not encouraged or were encouraged by the fathers or by the husbands. So there's a male guidance that seems to kind of, you know, be um, the parameter of, of uh, uh, moving forward. And we need to, this is, this is the whole thing, the greatest thing about Linda Nachlin's essay. It's not about just finding these women, but dismantling the structure and the language. We need to change our language of how we speak about the representation of women. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to ask Hala, um, if you don't mind the question, I mean, it's one thing having women appear, let's say, you know, in the market, but are they priced equally? Mm -hmm. Do women, does women art sell for the same price of their counterparts, despite the fact that, you know, you think great women artists, but, you know, when you compare, are they uh, are the prices you know equitable? I don't think so at the moment. I think it's a very very important question, and I think things the gap is getting narrower. I think the gap is getting narrower because there's more trust that you know this woman is a great artist regardless of her gender, and she's proved herself and she's up to do amazing things. I mean, um, I think. Um, the, the misperception in pricing also in the market is that people think that it's only 
us, the people who value art, are in control. But we're not in control. You know, we, we are reacting to the demand in the market. I mean, I really come from a belief that art is much higher and, you know, it should not be, uh, you know, put on a, any monetary value tag, you know, but the truth is artists need to live and they live off selling their work. So it's an honorable transaction happening. So I think that uh, what I find uh, hard sometimes is finding very young artists demanding high prices when they still have not achieved uh, enough, whether they're uh, men or women. So here I have a, a big problem and I see it a lot in the uh, in the Arab world, actually, sadly. I see it less in Europe. You know, you see someone who's in their 30s in Europe who has done many exhibitions and are working not harder, but, you know, like they kind of suffered to get where they are and they still demand uh, modestly uh, normal prices. And then in the Arab world, just because they're picked sometimes by a group show, or they're positioned uh, somewhere, suddenly they speak in thousands of dollars. And this I think is, is wrong and this needs to be uh, addressed uh, in our channels. However, I think that uh, in, the, in general, yes, they are priced a bit less, but I think uh, when they hit a senior age or a senior place where they've proven themselves, they've been into many exhibitions, they are acquired by top alpha players, museums, uh, international museums as well, and especially those who have exhibited in many countries other than the, their own country, uh, which is also encouraged to all artists. I think this is where the price starts to become solid. So it's definitely something that you're seeing that is a, a problem across the board as well. Uh, so Hayla, I want to come back to you and, and ask you, you know, in um, putting together these exhibitions, do you think it, it is more important that we are seeing not just um, exhibitions that cover just female artists that they need to be seen on par alongside works by men as well? Is, is that really vital, you know, rather than saying, here's a women's exhibition or whatever, because we want to make sure that that imbalance is addressed rather than kind of separating them in, into their own, you know, like we've been saying, it's women's art type of thing. Right. Yes, no, absolutely. I think that would probably, uh, at least, you know, in, in our day and age, do the women a disservice if you were to completely yeah. isolate them into, you know, just uh, women's exhibitions. Uh, but also, apart from that, I think it's, it's a more um, accurate telling of history. I mean, women did practice at the same time as men. So if we are going to write uh, histories and draw these networks and, and, and connections and ask, you know, what kind of dialogues were they in, if any, then we do need to present them um, alongside uh, one another. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, definitely, it's not about kind of making an isolationist claim for the women. It's more about, um, writing back the histories that may not have been as well documented um, and drawing these connections. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think men should and must be part of this conversation. Amazing. Please, everybody, I just want to remind you, if you have a question for our panel members, for our speakers, you've got the Q&A box right there. Please do type it in. We're about to start taking questions. Um, and and to, to that, um, I, I want to ask you, Zahela and, and also um, Hala, about some of the most surprising things that you found, you know, when you're looking at and very much looking to include women artists in exhibitions, what, what are the kind of surprising things that have come up for you when you're looking at female artists that people would not have realized before? Zahela. Uh, yeah, well, actually, one thing that uh, that surprised us as we were putting together the exhibition at the Sharjah Art Museum, uh, which is the the, the 50 50 equal uh, gender parity show. Uh, we found that women were actually a lot more experimental with the mediums. So uh, at least I don't know if this is just the Bargiel collection or if it's across the board, but with the, what we what we have in our holdings with men it's you know if it's a painting it's more often than not it's a oil on canvas or maybe a work on paper right sometimes with women we found tapestry weaving ceramics like Vera Tamari's reliefs we found um 
things done with uh, uh, sand and tar. Uh, we recently purchased uh, 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 these, this light sculpture from the 1970s by Nadia Saiteli from uh, Lebanon. So just the, the variety of mediums kind of actually surprised us. I think it's something that merits further research. Um, as to you know why women maybe they just kind of had access to more materials that or, or um, were already expected in many ways uh, to practice within certain um, mediums like you know it's something uh, maybe Nada or Hala mentioned where they were expected to do like embroidery or you know uh, maybe kind of engage with pottery and things like that so they kind of brought that into modernism as well and reinvented those modes of making into something completely different. Mm, amazing. Yeah, think, uh, you know, when I saw uh, the first time, I think I saw the work of Diana Al-Hadid in Sharjah, actually, uh, she was doing this like big structure in the middle of, uh, just in front of the museum. I didn't see the artist. So I sat, I, I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's an amazing, work i wish i was a, you know like a man because this needs like you know strong people to work it out and i remember visiting the museum coming out and then i see this you know beautiful little girl sitting there and it was me who judged the the, the work wrongly because i thought this could not be done by women and another time this happened also when i saw the work of um, i think the late farida lashai because i was with someone and he was like oh look at these strokes of amazing you know artist and he spoke about it as if it was definitely a male artist you know doing these large canvas with super strong uh, colorful stroke and again you know Faride uh, came out it was at XBA gallery in Dubai and she's like this tiny petite beautiful woman and you know the guy who was with me kept telling her you did this you did this so yeah we're full of surprises good <laughs> you, we have we all have those biases it seems right where <laughs> we make those assumptions. I just want to ask you about um, the upcoming Art Dubai, of course, happening this month. Are you looking at uh, hanging more works by women at Art Dubai? What is the percentage looking like male to female represented? So to start with, we are very excited that Art Dubai is happening, is taking place despite uh, all the, all the odds, we have moved the location to GIFC. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful fair, a smaller fair. We have some 50 plus participating galleries. As you know, uh, the whole selection is done uh, with our artistic director, Pablo Delval. And because of the changes, a lot of the galleries are still uh, uh, sending us their proposal as uh, proposals as we speak. But I know that we have a lot of amazing uh, women artists. I was looking earlier just like to see some of the, uh, the participating one. And I can say that I'm so happy to see names of contemporary young, amazing artists, as opposed to, you know, us celebrating like Baya and like Saula Roda, all these artists who did not witness necessarily their amazing uh, success. I think that platforms such as the fair and any other you know, activity taking place now is celebrating the artists now. I mean, I can just think of, you know, Ruba Salami from Palestine, Anya Suleiman, Suad Abdul Rasul. We're gonna find works by Ito Barada, Munir al Salah, Aital Adnan, obviously, uh, Zaina Khalil, uh, a few ladies from Saudi Arabia, like Sarah Abdullah, Lulwa Hamoud, Rimal Faisal, Khulud Bakir, um, Ali Al Ali from Yemen, you know, so it's a mix of, uh, a lot of Arab contemporary uh, amazing artists. The list is growing. Uh, in the next few days, I think we are launching the app, which is going to be available soon with all the works. So even for those who can't attend the fair physically, you will be able to see a lot of it. And uh, we will be posting. I'll be waiting for you all. And uh, as a percentage, to be very honest, I cannot tell you exactly the number now because where we have international galleries as well. So the percentage is quite uh, fair, I would like to say. And so, you know, uh, it sounds amazing by the way, but is it mostly driven by the buyer's needs or is it what galleries are presenting? What do you, how are you putting no, I it think, together? I think all over the world, the galleries now are very much, uh, becoming gender friendly and are aware of this. Uh, they have to be. I think a lot of the galleries are run by women, are, are owned by women. 
So, um, I mean, again, because of the list has changed a bit, um, I think it's, it's also reflective of what happened in my work uh, previously in the auction world that we're not uh, driven by, you know, a specific agenda. I think sometimes when you find amazing pieces, you want to bring them to your audience and you want to share them with the, the top collectors of the world. So, um, but I think that I'm here now and I will keep pushing to have uh, more women artists uh, on the world. Of the we have a really fascinating question that's come in from Sophie um, saying, looking ahead, what about the idea of art being created virtually or being sold as NFTs um, on the blockchain and with the provenances and details being stored and made available virtually? People are saying that this is an opportunity for younger generations to be involved in art and the art market. Is this maybe also an opportunity for female artists in a market which is different and driven by different rules? Who wants to take that one? I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really like here watching, observing. I read the news about this. Uh, this new thing, uh, which I'm trying still to understand. I know that um, like the blockchains are there. And the other day I met an artist and she was like, I'm a virtual artist. I sell my work with Bitcoin. And, you know, right. I feel that I belong to a different world, which is making me a bit look older, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am uh, trying to understand. I don't know. I think the future is so, so uh, interesting and so fun and we need to be open. It's art at the end of the day, you know. I wouldn't trust uh, going and doing a uh, surgery with robots, you know, yet. Uh, but I mean, why not? You know, we're spending our time on the screens most of the time. So we are experiencing things differently these days. We're communicating to each other via, you know, the virtual world. So whether or not we're going to have, I mean, I love video art. I love animated art. I love um, art where there is sound and interactive art where you have like a real piece of art and then some uh, digital element on it. I, I really enjoy uh, discovering these talents, but I'm not sure yet uh, I would place my own savings into <laughs> this kind of art yet. <laughs> New Personally. technology. It is just, it is a whole new world out there, Hala. So yeah, and I think that that is the space to watch right now in, in so many different uh, industries and art is definitely one of them where I'm sure we're going to be having discussions coming up around this more and more um, as the months and the years roll ahead and we see more people actually um, doing more of that. If you have any other questions, please do um, put those in. But I just wanted to ask the, the three of you, um, to, as we look to wrap up the discussion, the theme for International Women's Day this year is choose to challenge. And so I want to ask each one of you to see a more inclusive art world. What is it that needs to change? What is it that we need to choose to challenge? Professor Shabot, if I can start with you, please. I think this should be the theme of every year and should be mm -hmm. life theme, which I think it is my life theme. We at this moment, I would say, um, just hearing our conversation, I'd say we need to challenge the language of how we are represented as women, how our artists, uh, women artists are represented. So to me, I think, you know, language, the structure, because language expresses the power structure. So we need to kind of, you know, um, understand how that works change challenge it dismantle it you know it's it's great to have a 50 50 you know show it's great to have affirmative action in other words you know um to highlight the lack of um, a representation of women um uh, we need to make sure that you know hala next time sees a a a powerful art of work would not think it must be uh, a man's uh, uh, work we need to change we need to challenge and change these expectations that are very much based on language Mm. So, Hila. Yeah, well, it's so funny, Nada. I'm really not trying to copy you, but when I was thinking about this yesterday, <laughs> I was thinking language. <laughs> um, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, about changing language. But, um, you know, to add to that, I also think, 
different kinds of efforts need to happen in parallel. So, you know, it's great to kind of, again, as you mentioned, have affirmative action in the museum and, and, and so forth, but it's not only about showing more women in the museum and in galleries, but also rethinking education models and also looking at maternity laws and also addressing the pay gap. And I think, um, you know, these efforts, otherwise we're just kind of treating a symptom here and there, but if we are ever to have a chance at a sustainable uh, change or, you know, impact, I think a lot of things have to go hand in hand. It's like healing anything, right? It's always a more rounded process than just like a pointed, uh, you know, putting a medicine here and then it's done, right? It's more of a um, kind of holistic process. So that I would say that that's one thing we need to work towards. Yes. Hala. Yeah, I think education, education, elevating the conversation and, you know, telling the story of amazing women, uh, whether they're artists, writers, poets, mothers, uh, uh, mothers of martyrs, you know, like I think the Arab world has uh, a very rich, uh, uh, you know, wells of tragedies to be uh, discussed and amazing women to be celebrated and not only at the highest level, you know, I think from uh, down up and, you know, it's, it's not only those successful ones, but I think there's so many stories that need to be told and I think um, we need to continue the fight, you know, uh, of education and elevating the discourse because especially like in very um, like open advanced societies where a lot of the monetary uh, is celebrated, you know, like uh, I find it uh, horrible today, like honestly being a woman, I mean, I love um, that I'm a feminine, uh, you know, I, I love to be a woman. I'm happy to be a woman, but I just find that all this these trends on like you know the bloggers and the social you know like there, there's a lot of interest going on where it shouldn't be going on i mean it's it's fine to look at you know to to uh, and you see like the websites of museums uh, have less followers than some celebrities you know and uh, to me this is appalling and it needs to change i think this is where the balance needs to to be pushed mm. And I think, you know, it's, you speak to a bigger problem, you know, with the arts that, like you said, you're going into art school because you weren't good enough to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. It still is there and it needs to change. And we need to celebrate the creatives, particularly if they're women, um, you know, and it's just, it is vital that we see these unique talents and these incredible voices as well. Um, Katarzyna? I think that's how you pronounce it. It has a question for you, Sohaila. Uh, congratulations on the exhibition. She says, could you speak more about the research process for the exhibition? For instance, the collections or archives consulted and the complex process of gathering these sources and uh, getting and identifying the, the buyer works. Sure, yes. Um, I mean, the research process, of course, there isn't, uh, you know, a whole lot of published material on BIA, but it's also not non-existent. Um, so uh, the, the catalog of forces of change that Neda mentioned from 1994 included uh, work by BIA. Um, a few years ago, um, there was a solo exhibition at New York's, uh, uh, New York University's Gray Art Gallery, uh, which primarily focused on Baez Paris uh, phase, you know, her work in the 40s. So that also had a catalog with a couple of essays in it. Uh, we were lucky to be connected to Baez family. So of course that was a, an invaluable resource. And um, I have to say one of the most informative things um, was, that, uh, was that video interview that we received from Salwa Mugdadi because um, on the one hand, of course we heard Baya uh, speak directly to her work and her experience. So <laughs> it's an amazing kind of primary source, uh, but also um, the, the um, art historian and practitioner who was there helping Salwa in, in Blida and kind of translating um, some of the conversation, Malik Abdullah, she also spoke about not just Baya's work, but also um, art more generally, modern art in Algeria, which was incredibly informative. Um, in terms of finding works, again, uh, we were surprised as to how many collectors in the UAE uh, had 
bias pieces in their in their private collections. You know, we were aware of a couple of institutions, but um, and this was again done by word of mouth. And <laughs> Sultan again helped us here with his social media. So uh, once again, he put out a call, and we were connected to a few um, collectors that way. And some, you know, we would just see a picture they posted on Instagram in their house, and we spot would spot a buyer, and we would message them. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, in that way, we were able to gather over 70 pieces for the show from all over. I mean, we have 24 lenders. Amazing. It's astonishing. And congratulations once again on the exhibition. I personally yeah. cannot wait to see it. Yes. Uh, and so I'm excited. I'm excited for, for all of us to see that, but I just want to thank everybody. I want to say thank you so much to our incredible speakers, Dr. Nada Shabbat, Hala Khayyat, and Suhaila Takish. Thank you all so much for sharing your vision and your insights with us today. And thank you to the incredible team at Sharjah Art Museum. And of course, thank you to you, to the audience. And do not forget, as we have been saying, the must visit Baya Mahideen exhibition is on at Sharjah Art Museum until July 31st. I'm Sally Musa, and it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you all. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Sally. All. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Everybody. Bye.